All right, we got a lot of scripture. Let's jump into it. Luke 4, 14 and 15. I know I said I got a lot of scripture. And you're thinking, what? Two verses? Look at it. It says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Hallelujah. This is when he came out of the wilderness. He returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went through all the, sur the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, notice his last four words, being glorified by all. Amen. Now go, we're going to continue. Luke 4, now verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Folks, please get that. That's who Jesus is. That's what he came to do. Those words are real now as much as they've ever been. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and said, <clears throat> and sat down, not said, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, this is what shouldn't have happened. Is not this Joseph's son? And he said, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we, what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own, in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land and Elijah was not sent to, was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath and the land of sight and to a widow who, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. What a powerful contrast we see right there. In Galilee, he was glorified by all. In Nazareth, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Think about that. He was here. And they glorified him. He went over here and they rejected him, wanted to kill him. The thing about Jesus back then is you either loved him or you rejected him. It wasn't a lot of, wasn't a lot of in the middle there. They either just flocked to him or they completely disdained him. They rejected him. Today, we are a people who are not real wild about extremes. So what have we done? We are, we are neither all in, nor are we all out. But we're somewhere in the middle practicing love in our version of a gray area. That's not okay. I think I was clearly instructed. I think we were clearly instructed in Mark 12, 30. Put that up here, please. Love the Lord with all. That's not in between. That's, a, that's a, an extreme. Love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. That's what he has called us to do. <clears throat> but that was before America, right? That's before we became affluent. That's before we had endless entertainment. It's not realistic now. Seems like that, that seems to be a, a mentality that we've taken. But I want to encourage you with this. We cannot let the pervasive attitude of the world become the attitude of Christians. 
of the followers of God. We cannot let that mentality become the mentality that we have in here. And here's the reason why. Listen, I don't care how many countries rise and fall. I don't care that this was a time when Israel was, was in, under the rulership of Rome and now we're America and we're under nobody. Bottom line is God is timeless. Timeless. His truth is, can you help me? Timeless. His will is timeless. God's not going to change. He has never changed. And our whole life would be radically changed if we could try to go there instead of bringing him here. We need to grasp who he is. And if we just took something as simple as love the Lord with all of our heart and our mind and our soul and strength, and we quit trying to work so hard to bring it into something else and make it mean something that it doesn't mean, it would radically change who we are. <clears throat> you see, the thing is today is that what is pervasive is adjusting truth to our desired lifestyle or just ignoring truth so that we do not feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit when we live how we choose to live. That's become the norm. I got a news alert for you. I was talking to the Lord about it just this week. And here's what I believe he said. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. I want to encourage you to remember this. It doesn't matter if the church compromises God's never going to compromise. He's never going to change his will, his truth, his character. So the church can live in his compromise or it can awaken and get on track. I believe that's what he's called us to do. Bottom line is this, his plan is perfect. All we got to do is run with it. Instead of trying to change it, just go with it. Why can't we believe that what God has for us individually and us as a church is far better than we could even come up with in our own heads? But we can't seem to get that. We still, no, no, I need to have influence. I need to, I, need to, I, I need to have ownership. I need to make decisions. Yeah, you do. You need to make one really good decision. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you go there and see what he does when he gets everything. Well, back to the passage. So Jesus was accepted in Galilee and he was rejected in Nazareth. Love him, want to kill him. Good, bad. Why did Nazareth reject him? Two answers. Familiarity and preconceived views. Familiarity and preconceived views. Uh, if we were to go to Mark chapter 6, and if I were to, re to have read that one, or read it along with the one that we did read in Luke, you would, you would pick up a few more interesting details about what happened besides that one little thing that it says there in Luke. Aren't you Joseph's son? See, the Bible tells us that over in, in, at least in Mark's version of it, that he says, they looked at him and they're like, we know you. You're, Joyce, you're Joseph's boy. We know, we know Mary, your brothers, your sisters. You're a carpenter. You built me some furniture. I know exactly who you are. And you know what? You didn't study under a rabbi. So I don't know why in the world you're even up there teaching. I mean, who gives you power? You're a carpenter. And in fact, it says after that, and, it's, and it spells it out very much in, where is it? Mark 6, 3. They discussed it, and here's what they came up with. They took offense at him. They took offense. 
And sadly, America has become Nazareth. And when we speak the truths of Jesus, the very things that need to be spoken, the very things that describe and tell us who he is, a lot of people take offense to it. And today, we have churches on every corner, and though they are basically void of the power of God, they're still there. And what they are an advertisement of is basically familiarity that's bred contempt. Folks, churches need to preach who Jesus is. Show a pure, perfect, holy God. And if it's offensive, it'll only be offensive until the conviction begins. Or it'll be offensive and they won't receive it. I got news for you. Not everybody's going to get saved. Did you know that? But we need to preach the truth so that those that God's calling into the kingdom can know how to get there. Is this, is this, am I mean? Am I harsh? Can I get an amen? No, we really need to, we need to make it very clear what God is, who God is, what God wants, so that people can say, okay, I accept it or I don't. But instead, they're just blending in. America doesn't see Jesus as he is. I think that comes up. Does that come up? I don't, I don't know. I can't remember what comes up and what doesn't. This is very important. Listen, America doesn't see Jesus as he really is. They see Jesus as they want him to be. They are creating their own Jesus. What the world needs is to see Jesus as he really is. I don't know if you realize this, but today... They have absolutely divided God up. You got God in the Old Testament and you got Jesus in the New Testament. And they don't seem to link the two together. Unfortunately, he's the same God. Not unfortunately. Fortunately for us, he's the same God. Unfortunate for them. But they look at it and they go, okay, in the Old Testament, he was harsh. God was harsh and he was judgmental. In the New Testament, Jesus is loving and forgiving. In the Old Testament, God said, you stone that adulteress. In the New Testament, Jesus forgives them. I like the Jesus of the New Testament. He's a Jesus that just has his arms wide open, just accepting everybody. America's preconceived idea of Jesus. They got him, listen, they still got him in sandals, a robe with kids in his lap and a rainbow over his head. He is at the right hand of the Father in full splendor and glory. The Jesus that we read about in the New Testament, you're never going to see. The Jesus you're going to see, that I'm going to see, is going to be the one who splits the sky, the glorious power and the radiancy of God. That's who we're going to see. We need to quit, we need to quit rewriting the narrative for him and see him as he really is, as he's always been. The Jesus that people are portraying is not who he is. That's not our Jesus. Say that with me. That's not our Jesus. Or do you believe it? Do you believe that? He's not a hippie. Flower child. Just loves everybody. He is God. He is powerful. He is a supreme ruler over his kingdom. He is at the right hand full of majesty and glory. You get that? He is God. He became flesh, but he's God. He is now in his full majesty and glory. And you know what? When we see him the next time, he will either be the judge or the rewarder. He will be the judge of those who he does not know and the rewarder of those he does. And, and we need to remember this. It is, it is not you saying, I know Jesus. It's about Jesus knowing you. He knows 
those that are his. He knows his children. We have unfortunately created some kind of tradition of Jesus that is basically absence of true relationship with Jesus. It's a traditional Jesus. We need the relational Jesus, the, the Lord who redeems, becomes our Savior, and changes who we are. But that's not my message. I don't, anyway, here's my message. My simple point. You ready? America as a whole rejects who Jesus is. They would not say that they reject Jesus, but they reject who he is. That's the reality of it. They reject who he is. And what's sad is that you go into the church, and often the church, the church's portrayal of Jesus lacks biblical authenticity because we're just allowing him to be the Jesus of a culture. He's the timeless God. <clears throat> the problem with this, you ready? Is that how the world views Jesus is not that surprising, is it? Because their eyes have been blinded by Satan's lies. Their heart is darkened. But that the church would buy into that and would somehow have this whole mentality also. I mean, come on, you got a Bible. You read it and Jesus will talk to you. The Holy Spirit will bring truth to light. But for some reason, the, the mentality of Christianity today has just totally departed from some of the most important things I think that, that somehow have, gotten, have no longer been preached in the pulpit. I'm going to give you four verses. You ready? Go. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now, isn't that a lot of people out there say, Lord, Lord? Oh, I love Jesus. Yeah, Jesus and I, we're just like this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see the split? We like to, oh, he's my Lord. What happened to the, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven? You can't, you can't make Jesus what you want him to be. You've got to accept him for who he is. You've got to accept his truth for what it says. Go to the next one. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with overindulgence and drunkenness and cares of this life. Watch yourself. Folks, there are people that don't have anything to do with church and they may still call themselves Christians, but they don't, they don't really even know what it is that being a Christian is because they have, if they once had something or had a little of something, it's been weighted down. And the cares of this life, I'm going to get into that in another, on another day. The cares of this life weighted it down. Look at John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, how many of you know that that's a game changer? If, if, if you're going to talk about what, what G, who Jesus is and what a Christian is, that that one verse right there is an eye-opener. But, but who preaches it? I mean, that's my question. I wonder how many, how many messages and how many churches actually stand up and says, you know what, here's what Jesus wants you to know. If you love me, you will obey my words to you. Go to the next one. John 15, 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burn. We're going to spend some time on what abiding looks like. Folks, these words and descriptions of Jesus are just swept under rugs. And we have a Jesus that doesn't have these truths. And we have churches that don't have this commitment, this ideology of who Jesus is and what it means as his body and as believers to know the whole truth and counsel of God. 
How do we get there? Everybody's rewriting their own narrative of Jesus. It's, it's been funny. Over the last few years, we've heard people say, well, that's not my truth. That might be your truth. That's not my truth. You know how we got there? Real simple. Well, that might be your Jesus, but that's not my Jesus. Your Jesus may have expectations. My Jesus just loves everybody. Your Jesus, your Jesus might be Lord of all and going to be the judge, but my Jesus is just merciful. He just, he just loves me. We're rewriting the narrative. And when we do that, we are diminishing the authority of who Christ is. I'm going to say something. I probably should think about it. It's never stopped me before. I'm going to say, and it sounds really harsh. Because you're not going to portray, you're, you're, you, if you don't grab it in the right way, you, you're, you're going to miss the point. Jesus is Jesus, whether you accept it or not. And if you don't, it doesn't change one thing about him. It doesn't change who he, he doesn't go into the corner and cry because he's not accepted. Because he's God of the universe. He doesn't have to have any of us. He's just invited us to join in. And how wonderful the invitation is. I said, how wonderful the invitation is that the God of the universe would say, you can be my son. You can be my daughter. And if you are, all that I have is yours. What a deal. What a deal. <clears throat> Folks, my concern is that we are pulling him down when we just need to exalt him up. Lift him up and let the world see the glory of who he is. We don't need to make him fit into the culture. He is above the culture. We need to let the world see him for who he is. If they don't like that, that's not surprising. For every Galilee, there's a Nazareth. But we need to do the right thing. And that is to exalt him so that people can see him. Because you know what? I want people to make good decisions. And I think if you give them the facts, they can make the good decision. And the facts are Jesus is Lord over heaven and earth. And he's not a God of compromise. And he's not a God of, of emojis. He's the God of perfection who takes the imperfect and makes him perfect in a beautiful, wonderful way. All right. If we bring him down, we'll see him as less. And if we see him as less, eventually he's going to be nothing. And I'm saying this, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to continue to say it. Listen, folks, if it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't mean anything. And we're making a relationship are coming to Jesus Christ like it's nothing. I'll just, you just repeat after me, pray a little prayer, say a little, say a little words, whatever. Listen, if it doesn't, if it doesn't mean something, it will not change your life. It's got to mean something. And here's what it's got to mean. You're a sinner. You need Jesus. Jesus comes in and he takes all that wretchedness and all those failures and all that depravity and he just whoop, and turns you into a brand new creation. So brand new that he can bring his presence into your life and live there. That's beautiful. That's better than making him just a little bit more than a man. So, the consensus of the masses, if you're trying to wonder where in the world I'm going with this message, the consensus of the masses might be that they're rewriting the narrative. That is not us. You missed your opportunity. I'll say it again. That is not us. Come on. 
That's not us. We're not going to change Jesus. We're not going to try to adapt him. We're going to preach him and we're going to follow him. Amen. Because somebody has got to, to give us a clear direction. And I say, Lord, begin right here in Center Bethel. And let us be a clear direction. This is who our God is. This is how wonderful he is. This is what he does when he changes lives. This is the message that we preach. And we don't compromise it because it's too wonderful to compromise. I want to show you who our Jesus is. You ready? Hebrews 1, 3. One verse. Of course, the whole Bible tells us, but this one verse captures a bunch of it. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature. So he's not a different God than the Old Testament. He's the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And right this moment, every angel, every elder, every glorified creation is on their faces going, holy, holy, holy. And yet down here in America, in too many of his churches, we're like, whatever. No. No. Folks, he's, 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 he's more valuable than that. He's got to be that to us. <clears throat> Ephesians. Let's look at his church. That's who he is. Now let's look at the church. Ephesians 5.25. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, so that he might present her the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and blemished. Do you see the picture there? He's not trying to just gather up a group of people and call it a church. What he's, what he's doing is he's taking the body of believers that he has sanctified and he is helping them to live purified so that they will be to him a glorious gift. That's what we get to be. So here's some things I want to point out. You ready? The church is his love. The church is his love. He gave himself to sanctify her, cleanse her from her sin. So look, we need to clean up our act because we're the love of his life. The church is his glorious body. You know what the church needs to do in this sinful generation? Glorify him. Be a representation of the glory of the Lord. So that when we come together and we have church together, the glory of the Lord fills this place and it speaks of him and who he is. The church reflects him. It is time that we start looking more like him and less like our culture. How many of you are here in my heart? We got to start looking like him. He didn't call us to, to be compromised. He called us to be his. Husbands, there ain't, there's not one of you there that want to share your wife. Wives, there's not one of you that want to share your husband. It's, it's not about compromise. It's about wholly being his and bringing him honor. And loving him, absolutely. The church completes his will. It's time for us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to get on with doing the will of God and not just busyness. The will of God is very determined. And now more than ever, we need to get back to the basics. And I believe the basics are very simple. We turn new believers into mature disciples and, disciples and followers of Christ. 
<clears throat> Jesus did not change. Amen? He's never changed. He didn't change when he left Galilee and went to Nazareth. But Nazareth wouldn't accept him for who he was. They tried to place upon him who they saw and thought of him as. And because of that, the Bible says that he couldn't do much among them. Amen? And America is the modern-day Nazareth. Between our familiarity and our, our preconceived ideas, he doesn't appear to be doing a whole lot in this country. Oh, there's, there's still churches that are collecting big groups of people together, but th that's not necessarily accomplishing the will of God. The will of God is a church that glorifies his name. Doesn't glorify a man, doesn't glorify a program, but glorifies who he is. That's what we've got to go back to. That's what we've got to be focused on. We might be living in a Nazarene culture. Nazareth. Nazareth. Is Drew in here? Anyway. We might be living in a Nazareth culture, but folks, we can be the Galilean believers. The ones who glorify him and give him honor. We have a message that needs to be preached. It needs to be taught. It needs to be lived. And if we will, God will so bless and bring his glory upon this place. And he will make it like a lighthouse in a sea of disasters. We need to be that church. We are called to be that church. We need to quit taking this verse of scripture, take up your cross and follow me. We need to quit thinking of it as a first century commitment and make it the 21st century commitment. We still have something to do to take up and to follow the Lord with. <clears throat> we cannot, I'll close with this. We cannot let today's culture and its preconceived ideas of Jesus outweigh who Jesus really is and who we preach Jesus to be. <clears throat> we got to stop the compromise. <clears throat>